Thank you for joining us for this segment of Witham Sounding Board, practical audio-based information for today's on-the-go professional, a production of Witham Smith & Brown PC. Hi, I'm Dave Dacey with Witham Smith & Brown's Employee Benefit Plan Services Group. And joining me today is Sherry Ronco, who is also from Witham's Employee Benefit Plan Services Group. Sherry is a senior manager and is domiciled in the New Brunswick office. Sherry, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Dave. So let's kick this off. Today's topic is on the concept of blackout period. So let's just start with a basic question. What exactly is a blackout period under ERISA? Well, a blackout period would be a period generally lasting more than three consecutive business days, during which the participants or the beneficiaries of the plan are not allowed to direct or change their account balances, they're in essence suspended from any transactions in the plan, including obtaining loans or distributions from the plan. Okay, so more than three business days, that's the actual definition. Let's drill down a little bit. What are some examples of what can actually trigger a blackout period? There are several things that could trigger a blackout period. For example, a change in a third-party administrator or a custodian would cause that. As an example, if the plan was changing from one provider to another, there is time that's needed to take care of the record-keeping aspects involved, so the new provider is going to want some time to set up those new accounts. Another example would be a corporate merger or an acquisition or a major change to the plan, uh, such as a change to an available investment option. Okay, so it's three business days, and those are some examples. What about exclusions? Are there any types of events that are excluded from the blackout period definition? Yes, suspensions that are required by federal securities laws or suspension in accordance with a qualified domestic relations order, those are both excluded, as well as any regularly scheduled suspensions, which are usually disclosed to participants in a summary plan description or in a participant enrollment form. Yeah, I guess the theory being that the summary plan description occurred earlier, so they really were put on notice and it's part and parcel with the plan. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay, well, let's move on. Let's get into the notice rules. When there's a blackout period, there's a requirement to have a notice. What exactly are those rules? Well, Sarbanes-Oxley added ERISA Section 101I, which requires plan administrators to provide plan participants with generally at least 30 days notice. It can be up to 60 days advance written notice, but they don't want it to be more than 60 days. Really, the theory there is that if you provide more than 60 days, chances are people are going to forget that's too much of a time period. So between 30 and 60 days is ideal. And that's triggered from the start of the blackout period. Okay, so we know that if there's more than three consecutive business days, that at least a portion of the plan is going to be out of action with respect to the participants. And if there's not otherwise an exclusion, that there needs to be a notice that's produced. What type of information is included in the blackout notice, Sherry? The blackout notice should include the reasons for the blackout, the investments that are subject to the blackout, and the beginning and ending dates of the blackout period. So in the example that I gave before, if you've got a change in an investment custodian, the notice should say your blackout period will be from X date to X date. The reason for the blackout period is due to a change in the investment custodian, and all of the investments of the plan will be subject during this blackout period. You also want to give participants a contact for who they can ask questions to regarding the blackout period. So, for example, somebody at the company, a name of somebody or a department name, as well as an address and a telephone number so people know where to call to get further information about the blackout period. Hmm, interesting. Your blackout period notice also should include a statement about participants' rights and the fact that they've been temporarily suspended, as well as a statement that participants should evaluate their investment decisions given light of this blackout period and the change in their rights. If more than 30 days advance notice isn't given to your participants, a statement that federal law generally requires advance notice and an explanation as to why you couldn't give your participants 30 days notice is needed. Okay, so we've got the details on what goes into the notice. How does the notice have to be furnished to the participants, Shari? Well, the notice could be either via mail or in some sort of electronic format. So whether it's first-class mail, certified mail, express mail, all those would qualify. And with regards to electronic media, 
the notice could be furnished via email, or even if it's just available on a website. So long as it's easily accessible to participants, that's fine. Okay, great, great. What exactly happens if the plan doesn't follow the blackout notice rules? I imagine there's penalties. Can you maybe talk about the penalties for noncompliance? Sure. Well, the Department of Labor can assess a civil penalty of up to $100 a day per individual for failure to satisfy these notice requirements. So $100 per day per participant. So yes, if you had a plan, if you had a plan with 1,000 participants, we're talking about a lot of money for failure to do blackout notices. Yes, it could add up quickly. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we better make sure we do the blackout notices, or at least that our plans make sure that we do the blackout notices. Okay, one, one final question today, Sherry. What types of transactions are excluded from the 30-day blackout notice requirement, but may still need to be made as, as soon as reasonably possible? Well, if there is an inability to provide the notice due to some sort of unforeseeable event that's beyond the plan's control, for example, a hurricane in the area, areas out of power, you can't possibly provide this notice. Another example would be if the plan is in a bankruptcy. So, for example, any kind of deferral of the blackout period, which would result in a violation of ERISA. So, for example, in a bankruptcy where the company stock is an investment of the plan, you might not have the time to give that 30-day notice. But it would be imprudent not to like cease transactions with that bankrupt entity. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other situations? In a merger and acquisition transaction, that's another area where you may not have 30 days notice to give participants enough time. Okay, great. Well, I think that really does a terrific and concise job as far as going over the blackout notice period rules, Sherry. Thanks a lot for your time, and thanks for making clear that this is an interesting topic. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Dave. You've been listening to Witham Sounding Board, practical audio-based information for today's on-the-go professional. How can Witham help put you in a position of strength? Contact us with your feedback or suggestions for future podcast topics. Visit www.witham.com for additional information. Send an email to info at witham.com or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Witham CPA. Thank you for listening.